Aloha mai kako, e komo mai, aloha everyone, and welcome to our presentation on protecting sacred places under siege, living kapu aloha, the discipline of compassion for all. I believe that Megan was going to introduce us all. Did that happen while I wasn't on? Okay, all right. So I'm Lana Ka'opua, and presenting with me are Mike Spencer, and later we will be joined by Ku'ule and by Malia. Next slide, please. Land is sacred. Larry Curley, the executive director of the National Indian Council on Aging, says this. This country is in the midst of a challenging time characterized by the expression of volatile discourse. The land upon which this country was established is covered by the ashes and dust of our ancestors. It is therefore sacred land. What the US is going through currently, morally and philosophically, is an affront to the sacredness of this land. Next slide. We are going to talk about a sacred, actually we were asked to talk about one sacred place and the bulk of the presentation by Mike and I will focus on Mauna Kea as a sacred place and we will be followed by other sacred places and communities or kia'i who are working to defend those sacred places with um, presentations by Malia and Ku'ule. So just very quickly, what is a sacred place? It is a place of spiritual reverence. It's a center point around which people and communities organize and it's a place where a connection to something greater than ourself is experienced. To Hawaiians, the Mauna, Mauna Kea, is a sacred place. In Hawaiian, the name for sacred place is Vahipana. Mauna Kea is Vahipana. It is considered kapiko o ke honua, which means the umbilicus of the earth. Next, please. Mauna Kea represents a oneness and a connection to the natural and spiritual worlds. It is a sacred place and the zenith of our ancestral ties to creation. It is also in modern times an ancient burial time, a representing embodiment of our ancestors. And many Hawaiians continue to regard Mauna Kea with reverence and practice cultural traditions there. In addition to the sacred importance of the Mauna, the summit is home to nearly a hundred archeological sites and many cultural properties eligible to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Next slide, please. Critical to our discussion of Mauna Kea is the issue of ceded land. And so this is important context for what is going on. Ceded lands are acreage which once were held by the Hawaiian crown prior to the U.S. illegal overthrow and annexation. Mauna Kea is part of the Ceded Lands Trust and by law, the state of Hawaii is mandated to protect and preserve Mauna Kea for future generations. This is the state of Hawaii's kuleana, which in Hawaiian means its responsibility. The state of Hawaii is trustee and by virtue of that trusteeship has responsibility for overseeing the preservation of the land. Has this happened? Many native Hawaiian organizations believe that Mauna Kea and other ceded lands in Hawaii belong to the native people. It is um, the, the illegal overthrow of the kingdom um, is extended to, to the belief that possession by any other body of these ceded lands is illegal. Nonetheless, the, the legal in the US terms um, status of Mauna Kea is as a ceded land. Currently, there are 1.8 million acres of Hawaii land considered ceded lands. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are talking about Mauna Kea. So first of all, let me say that Hawaiians are not anti-science. We have a tradition and contemporary practices of science. The, the protection of Mauna Kea is intended to preserve the sanctity of the Mauna. This is the issue. Na Kia'i, the protectors or guardians of Mauna Kea, have a history of 
mismanagement um, and abuse on the sacred mountain, including a history of budgetary resource and other types of mismanagement, a history of hazardous material spills, a failure to develop and manage decommissioning of um, astronomy observatories that are not in compliance with the rules, and a failure to create an environment respectful to Hawaiian traditional practices. Next slide, please. So what is proposed is a 30 meter telescope known um, in popular parlance as the TMT, and it would be the fourth telescope built on the sacred Mauna. Some um, astronomers and physicists concur that TMT is definitely advance, in advance, but not without significant human cost. And so on the slide here, we see a quote um, from Hawaiian scientist Aurora Kagawa Viviani. Basically, um, Dr. Kagawa Viviani sees the siege on Mauna Kea as, as an example of 21st century manifest destiny. Um, and she says, to me, practices of science in its present form smell a lot like the American manifest destiny associated with terrible loss for so many indigenous communities. We recognize that the events surrounding TMT occur within a context of US-based injustice in this particular historical moment. And then importantly, she adds, including but not limited to ongoing disproportionate policing and incarceration of members of indigenous, black and brown communities in the US and the detention of refugee migrants in concentration camps at the US border. Next, please. Okay, this is a just added slide because yesterday's Sunday newspaper ran um, some real interesting reveals that, um, that um, reflect cronyism at the state government level. Just a few of those um, violations. Conservation permit for the TMT was issued before the state held a contested case hearing to allow opponents would primarily be Native Hawaiians and ecologists to present their case. Here's another interesting one. The TMT would cost $1.4 billion and importantly take 10 years to complete as per the state's master plan. However, the lease for the area expires in 13 years and there is no new master lease at this time. In other words, we would be spending this money take 10 years to complete it and three years to actually have it operational only. Um, the governor has nominated new land board persons who in 2017 voted against the conservation district permit for Mauna Kea. And finally, the epicenter of the anti-telescope resistance is the access road leading up from um, Pu'uhuluhulu, that's the area um, uh, of, of where the uh, protectors are, and then the road up to the um, observatories. That road belongs to the Hawaiian Homes Commission, and to date, the state of Hawaii has failed to compensate HHC for its use. Next slide, please. <laughs> the Canary Islands. So one of the things that has often been said is, well, if the Hawaiians don't want it, why not send the telescope to the Canary Islands? So the Canary Islands is also recognized as a wonderful site for astronomy. And it already has several telescopes, about eight, I believe, on Ro Roque de los Muchachos Observatorio. Um, but there has been pushback from folks who are there, similar to that which has occurred in Hawaii. Essentially, the sites, um, there are sites, cultural sites that are important to the indigenous people there. And there is a fear that their culture also will be further lost. Ecologistas in Acción have already taken legal action against TMT in the Canary Islands. Here's a quote from this group. We can understand what is happening in Hawaii. Development of astronomical infrastructures has been done 
without respect for the people, the environment, and cultural values. Next slide, please. We're going to come back to Hawaii now. So in Hawaii, land is sacred. And our kūpuna, our elders, have protected um, the transportation of um, parts for the telescope up to the top of the Mauna Kea. Gwen Kim, Kupuna Gwen Kim, is a social worker, now retired, who spent many years at the Queen Liliuokalani Children's Center, where she was the unit manager. So here's what Sister Gwen has to say. When I heard the kahea, the call for people to come up to the mountain, I packed my bags. Those holding the line in the Kupuna tent will not budge. Many have settled their affairs, accepting that they might not survive a frontal attack. It's a great honor in taking this historic stand against the history of injustice. To see the farthest stars by degrading and devastating the culture of the Aboriginal people of this place is a blatant continuation of racism and manifest destiny. Stand, stand with our beloved host culture. Say aole TMT, no to TMT. Next, please. So one of the heaviest kaumaha or burdens has been the siege on the Mauna and the arrest of kupuna who have been holding the line, who have been protecting um, vehicles from transporting parts up to the top of the mountain for construction of the TMT. Here's a quote from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. The Native Hawaiian community weeps today to see some of our most respected kupuna, advocates, and ohana family get arrested for voicing the same concerns our community has expressed for decades over the state's mismanagement of Mauna Kea. This brings a kaumaha, this is a heavy burden, to our hearts that is unbearable. Regardless of your position on TMT, we must all agree with Governor Ige's 2015 statement that the state has failed Mauna Kea. This conflict underscores broader issues with the state's management of the mountain. Next, please. And what is the role of social work? So way back, it seems now, in 2009 at the NASW National Delegate Assembly, the Hawaii chapter initiated collaboration with other indigenous peoples of, that are in or associated with the US. And this included collaboration with Alaska Natives, Native Americans, and indigenous Pacific Islanders and others. So we specifically sought to write a policy statement that called attention to social workers about the importance of considering, of standing with indigenous peoples and the attacks that go on in their lives. Specifically, we recognize that the spiritual, physical, social, and emotional health of indigenous people diminishes with the infringement of indigenous rights. And we asked our colleagues to advocate and support the rights of indigenous peoples in their efforts to gain, sustain health and self-determination. Next, please. So this statement actually informed the solidarity statement that was advanced by the National Association of Social Workers Hawaii chapter this year. And the statement was entitled Protection Preservation of Mauna Kea. It was written by four Native Hawaiian um, so NESW members, of which I am one, um, of which our president, Robin Takeuchi, is another, uh, and others. Um, so here's the statement that we wrote and that was endorsed by over 100 social workers in Hawaii and elsewhere. We strongly suggested in our statement that our kuleana as social workers, our responsibility is to strengthen protection and preservation of the Mauna. 
that we need to malam or care for the kia'i, the guardians, and kokua, or their helpers, and that we really lead through service. So using our social work values, our knowledge and skills, we work with others and seek to lead and participate in continuing education, discussions, and actual support for the Mauna. We also emphasized that when social workers go up to the Mauna, that we observe Aloha Aina, which is love and care for the land, and importantly, Kapu Aloha. And I'll discuss that in a moment because that is really critical to our efforts. So in short, we champion social justice and volunteer as support responders for Kia'i, guardians or protectors, Kokua, their helpers, and all other allies. Next, please. Kapu Aloha. Kapu Aloha is the discipline of compassion. Essentially, it is um, a concept or practice of speaking truth and of moving with aloha. That means actively participating, taking action that is pono, righteous or just, expressing compassion for others, including those who may be perceived as being opponents of our views. This um, kapu aloha is part of the way, essential, integral to the way in which um, kia'i and kokua interact on the sacred mountain. Next, please. Mike, I don't know if you want to jump in here with some of the history. Uh, go ahead. I'll have some comments at the end, Lana. So okay. Go ahead. All right. So this, this, these, these, these next couple of slides really talk about trauma on the mountain. Historic trauma felt from historical events of the past, intergenerational um, stigmatization and discrimination and secondary trauma. So that of watching others be violated in some way. And the key historical point really is when our kingdom was um, annexed, was, well, first it was taken over and then it was officially annexed in 1898. So the queen in the photo to your right, the queen is dethroned in 1893. This and the flag of Hawaii is lowered, which symbolizes the annexation and the loss of Hawaiian sovereignty. This is a deep kaumaha. This has been a deep kaumaha and sadness across the generations for Native Hawaiian people. Next slide, please. You know, I grew up learning about the story of Kuha'e Aloha, our beloved flag. So what I learned from my kupuna were that, was that when the Hawaiian flag was lowered at the, pal at the Iolani Palace, that, 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 that there were still patriots in the Hawaiian nation. And that the women resisted, resisted the annexation and they express this through their quilting patterns, the ku'u ha'e aloha. They did flag patterns of their uh, beloved flag of aloha. And they displayed these quilts in their windows, hung them over their beds, used them as blankets, and rested beneath the flag of their nation. The Hawaiian flag still has this special meaning in contemporary times. Next slide, please. And so, part of the attack on the sacred mauna has been to lower and slash kuha'e aloha. The state says, Hawaii officials say they had no choice but to tear a state flag, which incidentally is the Hawaiian kingdom flag, to tear a state flag that was mounted on an unpermitted house built by protesters blocking the construction of a giant telescope. Actually, videos show that the state didn't just tear the state flag down or the Hawaiian flag down, they sheared it. They took um, a buzzsaw to it and sheared it. And that this was intent, everybody who watched it realized that this was intentionally meant to demoralize Kia'i. And yet it is painful to watch this. 
And so I guess this raises the question for us as social workers committed to social justice for all, what does it mean to follow state laws if we believe it is unjust? And what is considered unlawful as the state government says, and by who? And very importantly, what are the implications of saying things like, well, I don't know the issue, so I can't take a stand, or I don't really have an opinion about this. How is this complicity by proxy? And lastly, what is our kohoia? What is our choice, no choice? What do we choose to do in this situation? Next slide, please. So, um, there was, uh, you know, the Kia'i got this word that the siege would, that, that, the, that they would be removed from the sacred mauna um, by National Guard troops um, and that they would be cleared from the Mauna Kea access road um, and as necessary, um, the law enforcement would use excessive force by way of chemical dispersants to punish and suppress our people standing in peace and protection of our Mauna. In the face of this siege, Kia'i leaders say, maintain kapu aloha and adhere to principles of love, truth, and nonviolence at all times. Imaka'ala kaku, stay vigilant and alert as the impending threat of state force upon us draws near. Kapu aloha. This notice was um, sent out to us on September the 3rd, and to date, there has been no removal. And we can talk later about some thoughts about why that might have happened or not happened. Next, Next slide, please. Okay, here's where we get involved with the mama as social workers. So the first kahea, the kahea e kahi, the first call to us came from the Mauda Medics and Healers Hui. Basically, the Mauda Medics recognized us as an or uh, as a core group, as potential al um, allies, and already organized, and, and and that we could be easily mobilized to provide supportive counseling, especially when Kiai and Koko returned back to their home communities. So. You know, when Kia'i and Kokua are actually on the Mauna, there's a tremendous amount of support and kapu aloha, living kapu aloha. But it is when they leave that um, there was concern because that support does not exist necessarily. So we were, um, as social workers, asked to come help by providing telephone support. Um, with attention to the secondary trauma that people have felt through watching kupuna arrested, flags being sheared, etc. Next, please. Okay. So here's the program we put together, supported by the National Association of Social Workers of Hawaii chapter, and with a whole host of I'm not even sure how many responders there are now, about 30, I think, responders. So social workers, progressive clergy, psychologists, and um, other types of counselors are part of this effort. The, um, the name of our warm line support is called Naleo Loko Maika'i, which was named by one of our former NASW Hawaii um, presidents, Haoli John Tomoso, who is actually now an Episcopal priest. So he kind of brings the spirituality together with the social work practice. But Naleo Loko Maika is Kapu Aloha in action. Essentially, we are a warm line and we um, have um, advertised and promoted um, our services, free, of, which are free and confidential, um, to Kia'i and Kokua and anybody really who needs to be talking about what is going on in the sacred mauna. Next step, uh, next, next slide, please. And then we got a second call. More recently, two other Native Hawaiian communities, both of which are on the island of Oahu, different island from where the mauna is, um, are under attack, are under siege. 
and Kuule and Malia will speak a little bit more about these communities because they're on the ground there. But the second call from the Mauna Medics was for um, Naleo Lokomaika'i, the warm line, to be extended to Kia'i and Kokua in Wamanalo and Kahuku. They too are seeking protection and preservation of natural lands, the safety of humankind, and the protection of native wildlife. Next slide, please. <coughs> so this is just my brief segue into when um, Malia and Kuule take over. Kukia e Kahuku Aole wind turbines is the protection of sacred spaces in Kahuku, which is an area on the North Shore. And um, private government in partnership with the state government and the city and county are seeking to build giant wind turbines. Next, please. So the, there's a, there are already wind turbines up on the north coast of Oahu, but the particular one that is being um, protested now is called Napua Makani, or wind project. Kind of a um, <laughs> redundant because Makani is wind. Um, but that is what um, the company calls it, Napua Makani Wind Project. And this would be the addition of another wind farm on the north shore of Hawaii with uh, a, uh, a machine that is uh, 568 or so feet tall. And the residents actually have opposed construction of the turbines for over 10 years. With respect to this particular turbine um, that we are protesting, um, it is to be built about 1,900 feet from an elementary school and poses a danger to children. Also noise pollution, potential contamination of ground aquifers, reduced property values of those who live in the area due to the proximity of the turbines to schools and homes. And um, the turbines threaten the survival of the last remaining nearly extinct native Hawaiian mammal, the hoary bat. Opea Pea. Next, please. Okay, we're going to go into Wamanalo, and this is just a quick bit of history. So, Prince Jonah Kohio Kalani Ole has been called by his people the prince for our people. And so he lived at a time when the co occurring forces of um, that co occurring forces, disease, westernization, deculturalization were threatening the very annihilation of traditional social systems and causing collective trauma. So, and many Hawaiians were also losing their lands in the, in the process. And so the Prince suggested and advocated for in the US Congress, the creation of the Hawaiian Homes Commission, which was an act passed in 1920 and this act established a land trust with designated acreage for Waimanalo homesteads in rural areas. Waimanalo is one of those areas and it is one of the earliest homesteads in Hawaii. Next, please. So Waimanalo homestead also is huge. Historically, uh, Waimanalo is a thriving community with many, many cultural treasures. Since 1925, it was designated as a Hawaiian homestead community. But the Honolulu City and County now has a master plan that includes building a recreational center. And to do this, the beloved Sherwoods Forest would be cleared. The community says that they do not want the clearing of this beloved site. And they question the city and county's wisdom. Why build a new complex? Why not put funds into maintaining the existing facilities? Why are funds slated for the park instead of housing for residents, including Native Hawaiian people who are living in tents at nearby beach parks? Priorities. Next. Next slide, please. So this is our, my, my Hana Ho slide. This is almost the end. Um, 
So the Kia'ia are the Mauna, Inwa Manalo, and Kahuku. We practice Kapu Aloha, but we are reminded by community residents, never mistake Kapu Aloha for weakness. We learn from each other and we stand together. Next slide, please. These are just questions for our discussion. If there is time, I'm going to um, turn the screen and the audio over to my wonderful colleagues, Malia and Ku'ule now. And Mike, if you have questions. Um, well, you know, I want to leave as much time for uh, the Manawahine with us uh, because uh, uh, I really want to hear what they have to say. They're on the ground, but, you know, I'll just sort of interject just a few points. You know, one point that I wanted to make was, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to be going back to the islands um, next week and uh, um, hoping to make my first trip up uh, to um, the site where the resistance is taking place. Um, but, you know, it wasn't the first time for me on Mauna Kea. I've been there several times uh, and uh, actually visited uh, prior to um, this recent um, past uh, resistance effort. Um, with Antipua case, or in my case, Sister Pua. Um, um, you know, I think the impact of, you know, even before any of the resistance took place, you know, the impact for me was not just uh, the Mauna, which is, you know, for us, it is the home of Wakea, our uh, uh, sky father, but, you know, the, the, uh, the thing that probably was most traumatic for me was, uh, hearing the bombings going on at the uh, Pohakuloa training area, which is just at the foot yes. of Mauna Kea. Um, you know, every 15 minutes or so, you'll hear bombs literally exploding, uh, you know, on the ground. And and with every explosion, you know, I, I could just feel my, my heart drop from my stomach, you know. So, so it's not just about the telescope, right? It's it's about, right. you know, it's, it's about our relationship as as indigenous people to our land and uh, the trauma of, 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 you know, actions like that happening. I think the other point I want to make is that, you know, a lot of people will say, well, there's already 13 telescopes. Why not one more, you know? And, and you know, I guess that would be similar to saying, you know, if you cause trauma once, you know, um, you know then you, you, can, you can do it many more times. You know, I think at some point, um, people, you know, need to say, hey, this is enough. And I think this is why we're at the point that we're at. I also want to say, you know, that there's so many implications for activism with this, um, with the events that are taking place. And, you know, I think that the attitude that I hear the state taking right now, especially in um, Waimanalo and in Kahuku, is this notion of nipping this at the bottom at this point, you know, mm -hmm. that we are our lesson from Mauna Kea been going on over a hundred days. Now we're going to try to, you know, we learned our lesson from that. Now we're going to nip it in the bud. And so our arrests are coming much more swiftly. They're coming in larger numbers. Uh, and the whole idea is to intimidate, to intimidate white people from taking part in activism. Similarly to the way in which you said that they shredded the flag on the Mauna. This is reminiscent of the lowering of the flag from Iolani Palace with the overthrow of the kingdom, where um, not only did uh, US um, officials take down our flag, cut our flag up into tiny pieces and um, gave them out as uh, commemorative items for the event that day. So we're talking about this ongoing trauma, not just historical trauma, right? Because historical trauma is one thing. This is what he did ongoing trauma that is occurring. And um, in, interestingly, we're seeing the same tactics. So, um, you know, with that, I want to just say, you know, it's so important that we have community voice. Uh, and so, therefore, I want to turn the floor over to uh, Malia at this point. And, and, and mahalo, Lana. That was such a beautiful introduction. Thank you. Ladies, I just want to just say one thing to, to the wonderful things that, that Mike emphasized, which is that our struggle is not unlike those that have been experienced by Alaska Natives and um, 
Native American peoples. And in fact, one of our most ardent supporters have been the people who, um, the Sioux Nation who, have, who, who um, were defending and protecting against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And they, have actu they actually had a rally for the Mauna and brought several Mauna people up to um, rally with them. So we feel that support because I think indigenous people understand that we need to stand together. Thanks for letting me add in. Aloha, Kule, you wanna go first um, talking about Kia'i on university or you want me to go straight into our Manalo and Kogu? Um. Yeah, I uh, I guess because mm, I'm open for <laughs> okay. There. So, okay, so Megan, if you can go back to the um turbine picture slide, just gonna leave it up while I talk, so you guys can get you know, um, yeah, that's the one. So um. So right now, with the movement of Mauna Kea, there is, even though there is um, generational trauma that's happening currently, um, there is also a renewed sense of hope, and there is um, a feeling of connectedness to each other and to our land that we are now um, tapping into. Because all this time, um, Native Hawaiians have been, for lack of better words, colonized. And um, can everybody hear me? I'm so sorry, I didn't even check. Okay. Um, so because we were colonized, now they're now seeing our kupuna, which is our elders, um, put their lives on the line to protect something that is so near and dear to our hearts. It is now sending um, like waves throughout all of Hawaii. All of Hawaii, which is all of our islands, um, are now feeling like, geez, can we use our voice? Can we make a change? Can we, you know, practice nonviolent direct action and actually, you know, make changes in our in our ways of life? So for um, Kahuku, the Kia'i or the protectors that are there. Um, I'm not going to speak on their strategy, but I can speak um, about uh, them putting themselves in the criminal justice system by ways of blocking the roads so that these, these um, turbine pipes um, and parts can get moved from one location to the opposite side of the island where Kahuku is located. So currently... Um, People are blocking the roads, blocking the driveways that all of this machinery and parts are being tra um, moved, um, transported. And in that blocking, which they are doing in a very kapu aloha and nonviolent way, um, they're all being arrested. So they are being arrested um, for like disobedience to a direct order from a police officer, which is just... Um, a misdemeanor however it just goes to show that once again the people's voices are not being heard once again this is something that they've been battling for 10 years and they're not being taken seriously um the the picture that you see on your screen with the wind turbines it does not reflect how closely it is located to the homes of the people who live there and to the school that is there. And um, I've been on the ground there and I've been in touch with KIE and I've been like, um, you know, offering support and things like that out there. And you can literally feel the vibrations of all these engines that are moving and turning because it's right there. Like, it's not like it's some far out, you know, um, acres and acres away from people. It's like extremely right there. And they are concerned about the environment. They are concerned about their children. They're concerned about um, the uh, the things that are coming off of the, um, the, ele the electrical waves, I guess, that are coming off of these machines. They're, they're concerned about the bat, our last our endangered species, 
the last native bat that we have that is a mammal, sorry, the last mammal that we have, native Hawaiian mammal that we have here in Hawaii. Because in Kahuku, that's where the bats play, that's where they live, and that's where they fly. Amongst other animals, but that one most specifically. Um, the bat will come out, come out later again in the Waimanalo on the east side of the island. And their protest because the bats go to that forest and mate. And that's where they come together and they procreate and they do all their lovey-dovey things. So they play on one side, but they come and um, make cakeys or babies on the other side. So both sides um, are trying to protect this bat. Both sides are trying to protect the future for their children. Both sides are protecting the natural resources that are actually ours by right. Um, they're both trying to protect water. They're both trying to protect um, sacred sites that are that are there on each site. So let me go ahead and move on to Waimanalo. Waimanalo um, and over there, the Kia'i or the protectors are specifically concerned about um, the advancement of their little town as well as the last coastal forest. So in Oahu, there's been so much development that, um, that Waimanalo has the last coastal forest. Granted, this forest is an invasive tree. It is an invasive species tree. However, it's been there already for a while. And it's already protecting, the root system is protecting the erosion of the shoreline. So to deplete those trees would be giving way to this new park that they want to eventually be in the ocean. Because all of that is a mixture of sand and dirt. So there's like a whole bunch of issues in regards to Waimanalo and Kohuku. Waimanalo also is a site where Ivi, um, the bones of our ancestors are buried. It is also the site where different heiaus are located and heiaus are like um, sacred places where people came to worship and, um, and pray and make sacrifice and um, connect with their higher power as well as their as well as the earth beneath them. Um, so it has a lot of rich history that people are not um, taking into account for. So at Waimanalo, they too also blocked the roads um, so that the heavy equipment and machineries couldn't come in and um, cut down all of these trees. The machines did get through and they did cut down through um, about an acre of trees, but this is just the first phase of the development. There's four more stages of the development and they are actively protecting also in non-violent direct action ways. So for Waimanalo, the first day of arrest and the only day of arrest, um, there was 28 people that laid down themselves and were carried away and arrested. So I am a board member of the Hawaii um, Community Bell Fund and um, we deployed and we decided to go ahead and support the movements of the PIE and support the protection and preservation of our sacred lands. And we ended up bailing them all out. So that was 28 just in one day. And mind you, Native Hawaiians are not, we are not the, um, I guess I want to, uh, let me just back it up. We are, um, subvert, like we are, oh, we are like the most people who are in prisons and incarcerated and um, targeted and mistreated, basically. So, with over-policing, like Lana was saying earlier, um, mass incarceration, injust, uh, pre-trial uh, detention, and the inaction of uh, policymakers and lawmakers. Um, unfortunately, one of the consequences to all of that is that Native Hawaiians are overrepresented. 
represented in the in the jail cells. And so therefore, um, our nonprofit decided to come together and create a way to um, help the cash bail system as far as the systemic injustices of this cash bail system, which Hawaii and Philippines are the only two places that have this, um, um, to help our Kia'i in the movement. So I guess um, what I'm trying to say is that we're trying to help in an area that is most needed in response to what is going on currently at Waimanao, Kahuku, and on the Mauna. On the Mauna, we've bailed out 39 people to date. Um, arrests have stopped now um, at both of these places, Mauna Kea and um, Waimanalo. However, at Kahuku, every night that there is movement of these turbine parts, um, Native Hawaiians are putting, putting their lives on the line to um, block. So the first night of the turbine arrest, there was 55 people arrested. And that's the that's like a large number. Till date, because um, people have been rearrested and recharged and are racking up charges, um, to date, as recent as last night, now there has been 105 people that have gone and got arrested over the, the um, turbines. So it is a very... Um, important thing i guess i want to say for lack of better words that that we need to um as social workers also remember that there's all the different aspects that we can be helping and cocooning to and kukua to kia'i um whether it's like lana was saying um the warm line whether it's offering support whether it's donating to the bell fund which is Hawaii, <laughs> uh, Hawaii Community Bell Fund .org. You can go to donate. So if you can't be here, you know, physically to help us, then that is a way that you can also log on to and donate because it is it is going to the people of Hawaii and it is going to the Kiai who are protecting. Just you know, just so you know, I'm I'm there. I'm at the jail cells getting them out and stuff. Um, so. So yeah, I guess um, another set of kia'i that we wanted to talk about um, was the kia'i that are located at the University of Hawaii. University of Hawaii is in partnership and does support um, the TMT being built with the state. So I'm going to hand that over to Kule right now, but if there are any questions in regards to Wamanano, Kahuku, Hawaii Bell Fund, or any of the other things that we're doing here in Hawaii, then I'll be more than happy to answer towards the ending of the pre presentation. But aloha. Mahalo, Malia. Uh, thank you very much, um, everyone, for even having us here. Mahalo Kumu for uh, the awesome presentation. Um, really having that, that piece to understand why we're doing what we're doing. So, yeah, you each has a pretty big responsibility with Mauna Kea and there's, again, the 13 telescopes are there already, have been with the approval of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, the University of Hawaii system is the only public education that's affordable for local students. Uh, we really only have that option if we want to go to a public higher place, a place of higher education. And so we don't really have a choice sometimes, and especially too, if we don't want to leave the islands. And so uh, our Kia'i, our, which is also the protectors, of Mauna Kea has also have a place at the University of Hawaii Manoa. Uh, there's a group of students who have positioned themselves at Bachman, Bachman Hall, and they've been there ever since the first day of school. Uh, but so what Malia and I have, have done um, in response to the 30 meter telescope and the way students have uh, kind of received that, a lot of our students also have been to the Mauna. Uh, and have shown a great disapproval of it, especially to uh, the Board of Regents. Anyway, they can submit testimony. There's a huge objection to the project. Uh, and 
some teens that we don't really see is emotional trauma that can be affected to our students. And so in reaction, Malia and I, and also our other colleague, uh, Malia, I'm sorry, <laughs> Sammy, uh, decided to do an owl check. So whenever we say an owl, an owl is our gut, emotion, how we're feeling. And what we wanted to do is have a kuka kuka or a processing group with our students. Uh, and we don't really want to say like a processing or a tough story to help get that sense of kamaka, that heavy emotions off. So we can process it as a group and show that uh, by releasing this negativity, this heba, we're able to be stronger kia'i and students within ourselves and maintain um, being a student here at the University of Hawaii, even though we have a strong opposition to what the university is doing for the Mauna. Uh, and so it's not a debate stage, it's really just a place to process um, how you're feeling. And we also do different activities while we're doing the out checks, such as, such as way making, our uh, different aspects to help release that tension, that hurt, that feeling. And so um, we've been having them at once at least, and all of our students who've been coming been different students every time and it's been a really positive impact however our kia'i at Bakken who have been holding space at uh, the president's office as a first day of school haven't been able to come to our now checks because where our now checks are is away from Bakken Hall um and so the past four weekends our kia'i have been locked in at Bakken Hall so if they wanted to leave they couldn't come back in and that you know, they had to make a choice whether to leave for the weekend and do responsibilities that students have or maintain their presence at Boston. And so even though they've had each other to really help themselves talk and process, um, I went in on a weekend to see if they're okay. And most of them seemed okay, but it was quite on some. And so even though we had an out checks for the whole group, we, we also started now check-ins with our individual PIE. Uh, and just again, because we want to be able to maintain um, a sense of healing and, and knowing that our mental health has association with spirituality um, and the way that affects us not only physically, but emotions have a huge tie to it. And so um, we're going to also maintain the mental health for future students. And um, I'm also been invited to... Uh, administration meetings that we have with our PIE because I'm able to speak upon the knowledge check and how um, the negative effects of emotional trauma, stress is causing our students to be sick, have classes, uh, you know, lower attendance in classes, and also the product of students' uh, work is going to decrease as well because they're feeling that strain. Uh, and so it's really great to have, be able to be at that table to tell the administration, like, yes, we need to be worried about their physical safety, but we can't ever forget about their emotional stress and all the other uh, mental components that has um, effects on them, but also being able to maintain spirituality as a really important part of the, their experience and why what they're doing is need to be sensitive to their students. And so, sorry, and like the short long time that we have, that's kind of a little bit update what we're having. Um, at the university, and uh, again, really do appreciate your time and being able to spread the word of what's going on at our institution, but then also in Hawaii, um, Paiaina. And so, mahalo again for your time. So I believe that on the slides are is at least my email address. So people are invited to um, send questions or concerns to us and feedback, and I will be happy to pass them on to my colleagues. Thank you, Megan, so much, and thank you to Dr. Weaver for making this. Yes, aloha and mahalo.